So for the underpainting, I'm gonna use ultramarine blue and burnt umber. I have my palette paper right here. Ooh, this is a very wide Sharpie. Seems like in 2022, my new thing is to take words and break them in half. I don't know why I'm doing that, but <laughs> it's just like a funny little thing that's happening. Burnt up number. I try to write the names out of the paint on the palette um, just to make, and I try to say the names over and over again, because when you're new to painting and you're not familiar with these colors, it's a little bit like I'm speaking in a foreign language. So I feel like if I keep repeating what the names are, it can help them to kind of stick in your mind. The reason that <clears throat> I use the mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt umber as my dark color or my black color is that when we get further along and we go into color mixing, this is actually a really good recipe for how to create shades. Um, so what I want is to mix these together. And what I love about this mixture is that it becomes darker than the brown or the blue. And if you don't have burnt umber and ultramarine blue, you can mix this with other blues and browns. This just, one, when you buy paint, the ultramarine blue and burnt umber tend to be a little less expensive than other colors. They're, there are widely used pigments, and so they don't quite cost as much, which makes it cost efficient. But as, also, they're, um, they're just more forgiving in the color mixing. If you have a tube of, for example, um, lamp black or um, any kind of black, that is actually a really useful color to use for underpainting. It, when I use it later on for the color mixing process, you know, on week three, what that black tends to gray things out a bit. So that's, that's why I have you all avoid it. Also, I never have to buy black because I can just make a very dark value by mixing these two colors together. You can see here that I'm using a palette knife. Now palette knives come in all shapes and sizes. This one is trowel style. Um, I like a diamond shaped head or a round. Um, and I sometimes um, when I'm teaching people to paint and they're mixing their paint, they go like this for mixing, which works, but it takes a lot of time. I tend to do a scoop and press method, <laughs> um, which sounds particular, but I actually didn't realize how I was doing it to be more efficient. and. Um, that's what I figured out was happening. So today we're not even going to at least, yeah, I don't think we're going to use white paint today. We're going to focus on building the bones of this painting. And so sometimes I have um, paper towels, but today I'm using cotton rags and then I just clean my palette knife off with this rag. If you're using a plastic palette knife or a flat palette knife, like those will totally work, but eventually try to spend the six to $10 to get one that's metal. You won't regret it. They're way easier to use. So I have my water handy. I'm going to, um, so a couple types of underpainting today, talk about it. Um, let's start with what I have handy over here, which is a seashell. Um, seashells are actually really hard to paint in my opinion. I'm not sure why I decided to challenge myself like this right out the gate, but that's what we're doing today. Um, as you're practicing, looking for things in your life, and you're coming to this as a beginner, what I would say is um, try lots of different objects. 
And if, if it's intimidating, try one at a time. And then as time goes on, add other things to the mix to build up more to look at. I like pushing fabric up around my underpaintings because painting a flat tabletop, I think is actually more challenging for me. For me, more information makes me feel more engaged. Not everybody's brain works that way. So especially at the beginning, I try to simplify. What I'm going to do today is a couple simple um, underpaintings of objects. And then I'm going to try to do a more elaborate one for about 25 minutes um, of some peonies and uh, skulls. So first off, let's look at this shell. My viewpoint of the shell is going to be more like this. Comparatively, you'll be looking straight down at it. Um, also, I recommend trying to paint your objects larger than life. Smaller is not, it may feel safer and more comfortable, but I don't think it's necessarily easier. And so what you see here is I have a whole mess of brushes and then I have to think about what I want to start this with. So I'm grabbing a size eight filbert bristle. This is hog bristles. And a number one Taclon white flat. This is just sable. I know from trial or error that I like these two brushes and I like how they work together. And I like them for this kind of size in paper. If I was painting something that was five feet wide, this would be the smallest brush I use, which is like a size 10. Um, and then I would have, you know, size 12, 14 brushes. If I was painting something very tiny, I might go for a little brush like this. Or if I was pushing this painting of the shell to the finish, I'd start using smaller brushes as I was getting those details in at the end. Maybe I'll grab this kind of wider brush with very soft bristles too. We'll see if I use that today. And then these are all really close in case I decide that I want something more. So let's pull this over. I want you to be able to see how much water I use as I'm working on this painting. So a few, some of you have been here before and you know that when I teach beginner's painting, I start talking about contour lines or gesture lines as ways to describe um, how to begin. A, a contour line See, I'm adding quite a bit of water. This becomes almost like a watercolor but I want it to be a little thicker and more opaque than a watercolor, but I don't wanna just use that very fat, rich paint on there so that it becomes like so paint intensive right away that I don't get this opportunity to move the paint around. This watery mixture gives me a little more flexibility. So let's say we're on contour. Think of contour as a continuous line. Now with paint, you can't, you have to lift your brush up from the paper. So let's do this. Often when I'm painting in a contour line, I'm trying to be kind of loose and easy about it. I lock my eye onto one part of what I'm looking at and then I attempt to move through by just making these repeated lines. Um, 
disclaimer here is that I've done this a lot, so I might be making it look easier than it feels to you. Some people right away really love this method and other people are asking me never to have them do that again. So um, you might find yourself somewhere on that spectrum and that, that's okay. You, you might not like this and knowing what you do not like is just as good as, as knowing what you enjoy. Um, so see, when I lifted my brush up and I came back, I just picked an area on the shell to look at and lock onto and follow through. That's right, you can paint along if you want to, or you can just watch and paint later. Sometimes in the Tuesday night class or any of the online classes I teach, um, I have a student that sits there and knits while she watches because she doesn't like to paint in the evening. And then she works independently during the day and sends me images. Um, so but other people are like excited to paint and they wanna get right at it and that's okay too. My, some of my lines there are getting a little off track and what I do is just try to note that and not, not play into that feeling of, I messed it up like that sort of despairing like thought process that the mind can go to sometimes. I try to not give that very much room in my teaching and my art practice. Um, I find in art making that our brains can really go into overdrive. There's sort of a fear response that can come up about doing it wrong. Um, and for me in the process of art making that at times could be really magnified. So um, I've had to learn to say no to the critical side of my brain so that it doesn't um, depress me or make me feel like I'm inadequate and I don't belong here. Um, what I find is that art making can be a really great opportunity for self-acceptance. Um, you know, it can be hard to do that in a work environment or a relationship environment because you're, you're working with other people. But here in this process, it's just a white piece of paper or a piece of paper, depending if you pre-colored it. Um, and so it's okay if you mess it up. It is really okay not to do this well. Um, in some days it's going to go better than others. But despite what's happening here on the paper, you can always be kind to yourself about where what's coming up. And that is the key of wanting to come back. If you make your art practice something that's about taking care of you and nourishing you, you are way more likely to want to show up next week or tomorrow. Um, if you let yourself believe any kind of critical or mean thoughts that come up about what you're making, and I don't mean to project my own insecurity onto you all, <laughs> but um, just in case there's anybody else in the room that like sometimes gets frustrated with themselves for not being perfect, um, there isn't really a right or wrong way to do this. What I'm showing you right now is just one way to do it. So this is, um, this is an example of a contour discussion of the shell. Um, I could move further along with it. And here's where I'm coming in with this fat soft brush. Maybe I wanna come underneath with a wash. 
and show that shadow that indicates that it's sitting on the table. Um, sometimes with shadows, I like to soften out these outer edges. I don't think I can say that enough because, so this is just a terry cloth rag, like an old towel. And then I'm kind of pulling some of this water away. Shadows are more believable when they're transparent. Now this is the underpainting. And if we were carrying on in a more advanced lesson, I would pull all this away, mix up a color palette, and then paint this over the shell. We're not doing that all today because whether you're advanced or a beginner, um, if you're advanced, you can choose to move on in those methods if you have that information, if you've you know, done more painting. Um, it's not, I don't wanna tell you don't move on to a color practice today. But if you're new to this, I'd rather you do one, two, three, four underpaintings. If you're painting from a photo, you can still practice underpaintings. If you're painting from real life, um, try different objects or try 10 paintings of the same thing. I don't care if they take five minutes or 25 minutes. If, you're very detail oriented and tend toward realism, it could take a couple hours. I'm not prescribing that, but I'm saying it's okay. I want you to lean into trying to see what feels right to you. So this is contour. Let's just quickly address this shell from a gestural perspective. And I'm going to take a minute here, hopefully, to tear this paper. I hope you can all hear me all right. I have a headset and something got weird with my computer settings, so I wasn't able to use it today, but next week when we get back in here, I'll be back on track with it. Um, let's look at this shell gesturally. When you speak with gesture, when you move with gesture, when you dance, there's like a flow and a movement that comes through. And there's usually a bit of a, a giving up because if you're in your mind and you're thinking uh, about what you're gonna do, there's like a hesitation in the process. But when you're painting and you start to learn how to paint with gesture, it's a bit of a letting go. Um, you're not going to always be able to meet that line with what your eye sees because maybe you're moving too fast or you're moving more openly. Having gesture in your underpainting creates movement and dynamic. And so if you're able to sort of incorporate this into your process, what it does is create sort of um, an understory in your painting of movement and going back and forth that later when you go to add the other layers, it'll keep coming through and it sort of adds a little excitement to the story, makes it feel more lifelike and not so still. It's funny to teach still life and then say, let's put movement into it. Um, but I don't know, I like to make the drama up in my painting and have a little less drama in my life. Um, it gives me an outlet for, so I don't like try to stir things up between the people I love. Um, so we're back to the shell again. Um, let's see. So here I am with my bristle brush. I think the bristle brush is the gateway to gesture. Like there's something you can't be quite as fine tuned with a bristle brush, especially a bigger one. So it doesn't hurt to try to start this exercise 
with um, a bigger brush and something bristly. Um, if you are not accustomed to painting loosely, this can feel really awkward. Um, a few things that I recommend is maybe trying not to paint from your wrist with smaller movements, but move to your shoulder and just put your hand, your if you're um, right-handed, put your left hand on your shoulder or vice versa. And think about coming more from your body and not so much from the way that you would write with a pencil or a pen. Instead, think about coming from that more interior axis. And don't worry if you think you did it wrong. Um, that, that doesn't matter here. Just show up and try it. One of the things that I had to do in order to learn how to paint gesturally was set a timer for myself. Five minutes, 10 minutes, you got to stop. Like, let's paint this shell as quickly as you can. In, you know, five minutes. Should you always show up and do your painting practice like that? No, but this is something to do if you feel like your painting practice tends to be kind of stiff. Um, or if, if you want to bring a little more life in, this can be an exercise to try. That is a gestural discussion of this shell. Um, Will I leave it like that? No. I mean, sometimes I'll do an underpainting that quickly and then just go over it with color. But I tend to like to get that out and then take another cloth. And here is where some more water comes back in. Take another cloth and so I'm dipping it into the water. I do this with turpentine or turpenoid too. Um, and just come back in and start carving away with the paint rag. Let's put this over here. So now I'm moving to a drier part of the rag. And I, I like using my finger this is still pretty gestural in movement. You come down through and maybe carve away these lines. Over here on the tip, it already started drying. So I can sort of erase back in. That's one of the beauties of gesso is that it allows me to pull paint back up. Pulling back out away from the painting like this starts creating form. Um, I like to get that kind of dimension into my painting early and then I reinforce it later as I put values over top. I'm being kind of playful as I put these little knobs in here. So maybe before like I let this dry as an underpainting I once again kind of throw a little bit of a shadow in here. It's very simple, not very complex um, underpainting. And then I'll take a little bit of thicker paint and, and maybe really put that more fully in here. 
The darkest part that I see from my angle of this painting is right under the shell where it touches the table. And so by describing that, I think it kind of helps this to land. Um, there's also a bit more shadow right here. So maybe, you know, before I move forward, I sort of look for how I can describe those things and pull that back over top of my more gestural. Let's move this out. Notice how I kind of take the brush and try to imitate the shape of the thing I'm looking at. So coming across, trying to fill that up. Maybe this could go a little darker. All right. Huh. So much for giving myself, uh, what was I thinking? That I'd have 25 minutes to do a more elaborate underpainting. Um, I don't have that, but I am going to paint until 11 a.m. And then I'm going to check in with anybody that wants to check in. I'm also going to give you a Discord link where you can post work if you want for feedback. And that gives you access to a lot more videos um, with different repetitions of these types of exercises. Or if you want to move forward for color mixing. Um, let me just go grab another piece of paper. And I brought some dying peonies to class today. So I'm going to demo painting those quickly. Sometimes I don't, or actually often for you all, I generally paint on a white background because um, I think it's a little easier for you to see. But let's see, if I think about how I want these to be arranged. But for me, I like to often put color or different gradients in the background. Um, if you're just beginning, I'd say start these underpainting exercises on white. Um, but at some point in your exercises, you might feel like you wish that you could add white paint to the black. Like you made a mark that you don't want to be there and you want to erase it out or shift it. I don't, um, I want you to start by trying to just use this mixture, but if you're like half an hour to an hour into practicing and you want to put a little white paint out here in order to play around with it because you think it's going to make your experience better, then I also want you to feel like you can allow yourself to do that. Um, I'm just going to put a little bit of titanium white right up there. And notice here, um, this is the titanium white from Golden. I, I recommend titanium white versus zinc white because titanium white is more opaque. You can see Golden has these little stripes across the top of the paint. And then this is actual the actual color of the paint over those stripes. So you can see that you can barely see them. And um, that just helps me to see what the opacity of this paint is. Um, let's look at um, 
another color like cadmium red is pretty opaque for a red actually, but you can see that the white was more opaque than cadmium red. Taking my spritz bottle and giving my palette a little dusting. If you're painting over, like for example, here I have, I just took my, I had leftover paint, probably a palette like this. I scraped it over this gessoed piece of paper because I never like to waste paint. More paint on a background of a painting only makes things better for me in my mind. So um, if it doesn't drive your brain too crazy, you might want to try pre-painting some of your backgrounds. This looks a bit like a mess, right? Um, we'll see if I can clean that up a bit. So I'm starting with my kind of wet mixture. But I have some concerns from going from the white to dark. So instead of black, I'm going to make it slightly gray. The moral to this story is that you don't always have to do things one way. Um, and then for flowers, I find contour as being a very forgiving and exciting way to describe flowers. So loosely, coming over for the whites more over this dark area. If, as somebody, you know, who paints a lot, like this is, this is part of my life, just like exercise or frankly, eating sometimes. What's nice is that, yes, I can take a break from painting for two weeks and I'm not gonna starve to death. Um, there was times in my life where I felt like I couldn't do that. Um, and now I'd say I maybe have a little more uh, life balance. And so I, I can rest more easily um, and I don't rely so heavily on painting to kind of hold up my identity. Um, but, I, but I do, I feel like I have a relationship with painting and sometimes I get stuck or blocked. And one thing for me is being able to come back to the sort of basic exercise. Now notice, um, I am both kind of using contour and gesture together at the same time as I do this. Um, so if you find yourself starting with contour or starting with gesture and going the other direction or going more into a rendering process that's a little more um, sensitive and smaller marks, I think that will almost always happen. You are not doing it wrong. All I want you to do is try to practice setting yourself on track as you're investigating and then expect that it's going to spread out. Um, what I was saying though, is that even as somebody who has painted a lot for many, many years and has an established practice, when I get stuck or don't know what to do, I come back to this baseline of just looking at something and expressing lines and reaction just for the experience of doing that, not for the intention of what my finished pro pro uh, project will look like. Sometimes taking yourself away from the expectation of what you want, what your thing to look like at the end so that you can just have the enjoyment of reacting to what you're seeing in the moment can make your practice a little healthier. And at times I've had to do that for months 
um, just to let go of the expectation of making something beautiful or something tangible or something powerful and instead be like, what if I just allowed myself to fail here? Um, and yeah, maybe I don't make the post those paintings to Instagram or share them with my friends even, um, but at least in, uh, at least I get to have that relationship with myself around it, um, of, of being able to not be that good at things all the time. Um, what you're going what you might have noticed here is that I had five flowers. And then as I was painting, I was going to go off the side of my page. And so I just took one out. I was like, never mind, we're going to do four. You can change your still life to make it work for you partway through the painting. If you realized you, you know, or just restart, like you, if it, if you're 20 minutes in and you feel like you're suffering in relationship to the thing that you're looking at, then start over. Do, do not make yourself feel like you have to finish and solve that problem. It's, it's okay just to try something that feels easier. <laughs> um, this leaf right here, I like quite a lot. And so maybe this feels slightly confusing with all the stuff going on. Although from my eye and my experience, I recognize that this is a pretty strong underpainting and that I could have a lot of fun painting a color palette and over top of it. But I'm gonna take this little soft fat brush that I had. And I'm making a, you know, this is juicy, but opaque. I'm just coming in and maybe carving around with this dark color, not because that's what I see, but because it quiets the background in a way that makes it easier for me to feel grounded. So I'm using my artistic license to invent a dark, quiet winter background. And just cutting down on some of this extra noise. And I'm going to go ahead and pull that up around here too. I had a little too much water there and my paint got more transparent than I wanted. And you know, just for the sake of my brain. I'm gonna go ahead and paint this all the way up to the top. And then I can still see the flowers. I know I kind of pushed them out of your viewpoint. Um, they got slightly messed up. So I'm straightening them for myself so I can see a little better. And then taking my smaller brush here. And now I'm coming in with these kind of white grays.
And maybe just describing a little bit better some of the value that had gotten knocked out because of the background that was popping through. Just slightly gesturally without a whole lot of judgment about whether it's right or wrong, just responsive. I think if, uh, if you're painting flowers, they can be challenging. Um, a worthy opponent. Um, but also kind of painting them loosely and more gesturally makes, makes them more believable. I don't know why trying to make a very careful painting of flowers often for me just feels not very believable as a flower. So they're, they're great. Um, still life, I think, to observe for practicing gesture and a bit of letting go because they don't like you to hold on too tight. So that could be an underpainting that I would then come in and mix a pal color palette for. Um, I just decided I want this area to be darker. I will say that I notice a little bit that my perspective here is slightly off. It's a little popped up. Um, so I would have an awareness of that and make a decision about whether I wanted to change it. Maybe it's that this stem actually needs to come over this way a bit. And that sort of started already to settle it down to my eye. It may be that I'm like, I need more information around here. This is too central. And I paint some fabric in around these. I know the painting I did this week that I had like a little um, possum skull that I set on top of the pian peonies. And I liked having the juxtaposition of two different textures next to each other. Maybe I change my still life and put the shell, you know, on those and paint that in. Um, but keep it as simple or make it as complex as works for you. Um, this is really about you making the process personalized. And in an online class, I think <clears throat> what's nice is that you're at home and you get to take as much or as little time that feels correct for you. And um, I really want to make this work for you so that you en enjoy your art making to the best of your ability and kind of ask me for what you need, tell me your questions, email me, post to Discord, I won't get to that every day, but I try to touch base at least once a week. Um, and if you kind of are more introverted and you feel better in the process by just showing up here and clicking off before I check in with people or you don't feel like sharing in front of the group, that doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Like I'm here to serve you in this process. And so just check in with your interior self and ask, you know, what works best for you. Um, with that said, I'm going to stop the recording.